Hey guys, welcome back to my True Crime Story channel. Let's continue with the book. Next case is Michael Carneo. All of us know a kid like this from high school. The kid who was put upon, pushed around, called names, mocked and teased. The kid who was alone or the outsider, the kid who just doesn't fit in. At Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky, in the year 1997, that kid was Michael Carneo. Michael was a frail boy, both in stature and temperament. Standing just five foot two, the slim and bespectacled 14-year-old was too small for most sports. When he did try out for baseball, his failure to make contact with the ball on any of his swings just saw him earn further ribbing from his teammates. Many kids in similar situations find solace in their academic achievements, but Michael's grades were just slightly above mediocre. He was a steady B student, certainly no match for a straight A older sister Kelly. And so Michael tried other ways to fit in. He tried to be an extra nice and extra helpful towards his fellow students. All that got him was more cruelty. Someone had started a rumor that Michael was attracted to a male student at the school, and now the labels of faggot and homo were added to the many that were already being applied to him. The, psych the physical abuse intensified too. On one occasion, Michael's science project, something he'd labored over for weeks, was snatched away from him and tossed into the school roof by a group of boys. Children put into these situations respond in different ways. Some tough it out and somehow get through to the other side and scathed. Others also see it through but carry the scene scars with them for the rest of their lives. In still other cases, the victims of such bullying turn their anger inwards and begin self-harming. Some even commit suicide. And then there are those who strike back against their abusers or against society in general. Those who knew Michael Carnia would certainly not have picked him in this latter category. If anything, Michael was an overly sensitive boy. He would cry over the plight of homeless people. He quit karate classes after accidentally giving a fellow student a nosebleed. At night, he'd creep out of his bed to sleep in the den so he'd be closer to his parents. These are not the typical signs of a young man who was contemplating violence. But the constant bullying was bringing about a change in Michael. He was becoming increasingly paranoid. He started to believe that someone was spying on him through the air vents in the shower. He also became convinced that someone was trying to harm his family. When his mother found several kitchen knives hidden under his mattress, he said that he'd put them there for protection. Sometimes he'd get up in the middle of the night and creep into his parents' room, holding a knife so that he could see that they were okay. Then they, there were worrying indicators at school, too. Michael's creative writing projects from that time all followed a similar theme of him having to heroically protect his family from some sinister assailants. In at least one of these essays, he described the attackers as preppies. If teachers were concerned by these outpourings, they said nothing and took no action. They'd soon have cause to regret their negligence. By the fall of 1997, it should have been clear to anyone who was paying attention that all was not right with Michael Carneal. His grades had slumped significantly, and he developed the disconcerting habit of rocking compulsively back and forth in his seat. He'd also developed a near obsession with the movie The Basketball Diaries. In it, a young outcast played by Leonardo DiCaprio fantasizes about taking a gun to school and shooting his teacher and classmates. The movie definitely struck a chord with Michael. He began talking constantly about it, assuring classmates that he, too, was planning something big. Sometimes he went even further, describing how he'd like to pull a gun at school and watch as everyone ran for their lives. No one took him seriously, although they might have felt differently had they known that he was carrying his father's revolver in the bottom of his book bag. And then Michael acquired his own weapon. It was a .22 caliber Ruger that he'd stolen from neighbors and which he began carrying around with him whenever he went. One day, he even pulled it on a couple of classmates, but the boys were unimpressed. They told him the gun looked puny. Perhaps that is what motivated Michael to begin assembling an arsenal. Over the Thanksgiving weekend, while his neighbors were away, Michael Carneal sneaked in through their basement window and stole a shotgun, two rifles, and a handgun, carrying them away in a duffel bag he'd brought along for that purpose. A day earlier, he'd warned some students who had been nice to him to stay away from an early morning prayer group that met before the start of classes each day. 
On Monday, December 1st, he wrapped his array of weapons by now supplemented with his father's shotgun. In the bed, she didn't carry the heavy load out to his sister's car. When Kelly asked what was in the package, he said it was part of an English project. Props for a play. His trusty .22 Ruger, meanwhile, was stashed in his book bag. Michael entered the school building that day looking at his heavy load. When a student asked him what he was carrying, he simply said guns and started giggling. As always, his oddball remark was taken as a joke. Except that this time it wasn't a joke. Heading directly for the front lobby, where the prayer group was just concluding its meeting, Michael set his bundle down on the floor. Then he calmly reached into his book bag and produced two bright orange earplugs, which he placed in his ears. His next dip into the book bag brought out the Ruger, cocked and ready. He started shooting immediately. Nine shots were fired that day at close range and in the marrow confines of the corridor. They were deadly. As students that ran screaming and scampering for cover, eight of them failed to rise from the floor. Three, Nicole Haley, 14, Casey Steger, 15, and Jessica James, 17, were dead or critically injured. Five more were seriously hurt. Four would later recover from their injuries, but 15-year-old Macy, Missy Jenkins was paralyzed from the chest down and would be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Having carried out his deadly shooting spree in a matter of seconds, Michael Carneal placed his weapon down on the ground. The array of guns he'd brought with him lay unused nearby. God only knows the damage he might have inflicted and had decided to continue shooting. Cornell was taken into custody by school principal Bill Bond, who locked him in a classroom until the police arrived. He was then transported to police headquarters where he made a full statement. I can't believe I did that, Cornell reported it, he said, admitting that I thought it would be different. Michael Carnia was brought before the courts in December 1998, charged with three counts of murder and five of attempted murder. He was tried as an adult with his attorney pleading him not guilty by reason of insanity. That plea was rejected by the jury who found Carnell guilty as charged and sentenced him to life in prison with parole eligibility in 25 years. Pauline Parker and Julia Holm. Folle de Adore is a term that was first coined by French psychologists Lasque and Fabre. Loosely translated, it means collective insanity. In its original interpretation, it refers to two people who share a common psychotic delusion. These days, the Folle Adore is more commonly used to describe a bond between two people that brings up the worst in each individual, often leading to criminal acts. Although the phenomenon is quite rare, there are any number of gruesome twosomes that fit the bill, from teenage thrill killers Leopold and Lub to serial killing partners like Bruno and Bonacci, Bittaker, and Norris and Lake and NG. Another example is a famous case from New Zealand involving two teenage girls, Pauline Parker and Juliet Holm. Pauline Yvonne Vaughn Parker was born in Christchurch, New Zealand on May 26, 1938. Her father, Herbert Reaper, owned a successful wholesale fish market. Her mother, Honora Parker, was a Pauline Yvonne Parker was born in Christchurch, New Zealand on May 26, 1938. Her father, Herbert Reaper, owned a successful wholesale fish market. Her mother, Hanara Parker, was a homemaker. The couple was never married. When Pauline was a child, she was hospitalized with osteomyelitis, a crippling infection of the bone marrow. It left her with a permanent lip and limp and rendered her incapable of participating in physical activities at school. Julianne Marianne Mar Mar Holm had also suffered illness as a child. In her case, it was tuberculosis and resulted in her being sent from her home in England to live in the Bahamas, where it was hoped that the warmer weather would have a beneficial effect. Juliet's father was the brilliant psychiatrist, Dr. Henry Ram Rains Ford Holm. Her mother was, a Hilda Mar was Hilda Mar Mar Marianne Holm, who was prominent in charity work. 
1951, Dr. Hume was offered the position of rector at the University of Canterbury. He accepted bringing his family, which also included Julia Singer with Jonathan, to Christchurch. The first two years of Julia's life in New Zealand was spent in and out of the hospital, but eventually when she was 15, she had recovered enough to attend Christchurch Girls' High School, which was where she met Pauline Parker, initially drawn to each other due to their shared experiences with serious illnesses as children. The two were inseparable. The friendship was unconventional. Pauline and Juliet began concocting an elaborate fantasy world with their own region and conventions of morality. They rejected the tenets of Christianity and invented their own saints, based on movie stars and singers of the era. They envisioned their own version of heaven, which they called the fourth world. According to their belief system, they could enter it into this fourth world when they have reached spiritual enlightenment. That enlightenment was achieved through their friendship. The girls also made up a more down-to-earth fantasies. Both were keen writers, and they'd spend hours together coming up with stories, dubbing themselves Gina and Deborah. They'd often speak out at night to act out their story ideas, eventually concocting a plan to run away to Hollywood, where they believed some movie studio would sap up their stories and make them famous. They even started an orchestrated campaign for shoplifting, hoping to raise money for the trap. Initially, the two families were pleased about the friendship between the two girls, but as the obsessive nature of the relationship became evident, they became concerned. Pauline's mother even sent her to see a psychiatrist who reported that he believed the pair was engaged in a lesbian relationship. In later years, Julia Holmes strongly denied that there was ever anything physical between her and Pauline. The chain of events that would eventually lead to murder was set in motion when Juliet's mother started having an affair with a man named Walter Perry, who rented a cottage on their property. Not long after, the Holmes announced that they were separating, with Henry resigning his post at the university and returning to England, taking Jonathan with him. Juliet was to be sent to relatives in South Africa on sudden belief for her health, but there can be little doubt that her parents saw it as the ideal opportunity to separate her from Pauline. The girls were distraught at the news. That is until Julie had flighted a new idea. What if Pauline come to South Africa with her? Excited at this prospect, both girls rushed home to discuss the idea with their parents. They met with their flat refusal with Honora Parker, particularly for furious and opposing the plan. It is not certain which of the pair first came up with the idea of killing Hanara. The entries from Pauline's diary, which were read into evidence at the trial, suggest that she was already thinking along these lines in early 1954. On February 23rd, she recorded, Why could not mother die? Dozens thousands of people are dying. Why not mother and father too? Life is very hard. At the same time that investigators were getting an ID on their victim, another attendee of the Clear Path School was telling a quite horrendous story to a girl he was trying to impress. According to 17-year-old Jose Reyes, he and 16-year-old Buddy had lured a girl from a party to an abandoned apartment for sex. Their plan, however, was, a, was far more sinister than that. I already sold my soul to the devil, Reyes boasted, but Victor wanted to do the same. And for that, we needed a sacrifice. He then went on to describe how he and Victor had fed the girl alcohol and marijuana, then persuaded her to watch the nearby apartment block with them to have sex. The girl had agreed, and the sex had at first been consensual. But then in the middle of the act, Reyes had pulled out a screwdriver and started stabbing her. When she broke free and tried to run, his cohort blocked her path and clotheslined her. They'd then bludgeon her with the toilet tank lid and with the heavy ashtray. And and they then continued stabbing her, ignoring her cries of mercy as they gouged out one of her eyes. Finally, they'd strangled her. Before leaving the apartment, they'd carved an inverted cross into her belly. Satan was watching us all the while, he said. It was what he wanted. Reyes had been chuckling while he told this gruesome story, quite ob oblivious to the shock on the young woman's face, and he wasn't done with the telling just yet. He soon found another girl to share his tale with. When this young woman said she didn't, that she didn't believe him, he produced his mobile phone and showed her photographs of him and another boy having sex with a girl. 
That's the hoe we wasted, he said proudly. Then he broke into a freestyle rap in which he recalled details of the horrific murder. The young woman left in a hurry. But she couldn't shake the story from her mind. Even though she was still half convinced that Reese had made the whole thing up, she decided to tell Reese's older sister about it. She, in turn, called it into the police. That same afternoon, Jose Reyes was in custody. Reyes wasted a little time jousting with detectives over the details of the crime. He confessed immediately, sparing none of the details and chuckling occasionally as he spoke. He also named his accomplice, 16-year-old Victor Al Alas, another ClearPath student. On Monday, February 10, 2014, police officers took Victor Alice into custody and charged both boys with capital murder. The trials would be held separately, with Jose Reyes coming before the Harris County Court on December 9, 2014. There, the state's key witnesses, 19-year-old Miranda Leal and 17-year-old Ag Agapa Peter Gonzalez, repeated the sickening details of the murder that Reyes had shared with them. Not that Ray seemed to mind. He was sat grinning through most of the proceedings, quite obviously enjoying his brief moment of stardom. He wasn't quite so jovial when, they, when the jury found him guilty as charged, and the judge handed down the mandatory sentence of life without parole. Victor Ellis was next, appearing before the courts on December 11, 2014. The Ellis trial was not much of a circus, but his attorney did argue hard hard to have the case moved to the jurisdiction of the juvenile courts. When that motion was denied, he argued that Alice should be tried for criminal homicide rather than capital murder since the killing had not been planned and no other crime had been committed during its commission. This is a quite ludicrous argument since the victim was forcibly detained, amounting to kidnapping. She also could not legally have given consent for sex since she was a minor. And in any case, while the sex may have initially been consensual, it had ended as rape. In the end, the jury took just an hour to convict Victor Ellis. Both he and Jose Reyes will spend the rest of their lives behind bars. All right, it's only at 17 minutes, so we're going to read a few more in here. Justina Morley. I am a cold-blooded, death-worshipping bitch who survives by feeding off the weak and lonely. I lure them, and then I crush them. These are not the words of some hardened criminal, but rather a 15-year-old girl named Justina Morley. The words, nonetheless, are chilling, and they cause one to wonder... What would lead a young girl to such a dark and cynical view of the world? The path, unfortunately, is an all-too-familiar one. Justina had been a problem child from an early age. She began smoking marijuana when she was just 10 years old and soon progressed from there to swallowing prescription pills, which she stole from her mother. Soon she was also sorting cocaine, paying for the drugs by offering herself for sex. She developed another aberrant behavior by then, one that was every bit as dangerous as her coke habit. Justina liked to self-mutilate, slicing her at her wrists and thighs and landing herself in hospital in 2002 after an apparent suicide attempt. She was just 13 at the time. Shortly after her release from the hospital, she was expelled from the holy name of Jesus Catholic School and effectively dropped out, having not yet completed the eighth grade. Her life from then on became an endless cycle of getting high and raising the money to get high. Jason Sweeney was cut off was Jason Sweeney was cut from a completely different swath of cloth to Justina Morley. He was an upstanding young man who harbored aspirations of becoming a Navy SEAL. Jason had in fact been accepted into the Valley Morgue Military School, a vital first step on the road to his ambition. But his parents had lacked the funds to pay the tuition fees. And so sixteen year old Jason had taken a job with the con construction firm in order to raise the money himself. It was around this time that he met Justina Morley. It was love at first sight for Jason. He never had a serious girlfriend before, and the dark-haired Justina was not only pretty but also sweet with a naive naivety that was quite appealing, belying that innocence was an allure that seemed to transcend her tender years. 
In no time at all, she was dropping none too subtle hints as to the pleasures that awaited Jason should they manage some time alone. Was Jason interested? He was a 16 year with a heady mix of male hormones pulsing through his bloodstream. Of course he was interested. When Justina suggested they hook up at a makeout spot, known locally as the Trails, Jason agreed immediately. A date was thus set for Friday, May 30th, 2003. Jason would meet up with Justina after he finished work. What Jason didn't know was that he was not the only man in Justina's life at the, this time. The, pre the precocious teen regularly got high with the tree of miscreants. 17-year-old Edward Batsing and Co Koya brothers Nicholas and Dominic, age 16 and 17 respectively. She was also sleeping with Batsig. And with Dom Koya, Badzig was known to Jason. In fact, they had been friends since the fourth grade. The spot that Jason and Justina had chosen for their rendezvous is in a densely wooded area alongside the Delaware River near Fishtown, Pennsylvania. After finishing work on that Friday, Jason picked up Justina, and they drove east on I-95, eventually leaving the highway and taking a dirt road up into the woods. There they started to make up before Justina suggested that they get out of the car. She proposed that they take their clothes off and Jason wasted no time in complying. He had just removed his sneakers and unbuttoned his fly when Brad Sig and the Coyle brothers emerged from the shadows. Batwig was carrying a hatchet while Dominic wielded a ball-peen hammer. Jason did not even have time to register what was happening before they waded in on him. It was Bad Sig who struck the first blow, delivering a vicious hit to Jason's head with the hatchet. With the victim still reeling, Dominic Coya weighed in with the hammer. Guys, no, please stop, Jason cried, but his attackers weren't listening. Blow after blow rained down. At one point, Jason tried to run, but he was blinded by the blood in his eyes and weakened by the injuries he'd suffered. He fell face down in the dirt, and Dominic then jumped on his back and beat at his head until the hammer became lodged in Jason's skull and had to be yanked free. Now Nick Koya joined, joined the fray and carried over a large rock, which he dropped on Jason's head. The victim, thankfully, was unconscious by now. Soon there'd be no life, life left in him at all. Jason Sweeney was dead, and the quartet of reprobates, who had ambushed him now, carried out the main purpose of the murderous act. They went through the dead man's pockets and lifted the money he was carrying. The $500 he'd just been paid for his week's work. $500 bought a lot of smack, and they partied hard that night while Jason's brutalized remains lay cooling in the woods. They even took the time for a group hug and congratulated themselves on a job well done. The murder of Jason Sweeney would not remain unsolved for long. After the discovery of the body, a friend of the Koya brothers came forward to brag about how they'd lured Jason to the trails and then beaten him to death. Before they'd even come down from their ill-gotten high, the brothers were in custody. Under interrogation, they soon gave up Bad Sig and Morley. Since all of the defendants were juveniles, the first order of business was to decide in which court they would be tried. It did not take long for a judge to decree that they would be charged as adults. Then Justine and Morley's attorneys tried a new ploy, offering evidence of her depression, suicide attempts, and substance abuse in an attempt to have her case reassigned to the juvenile courts. When this was rejected, Mar Morley offered to turn state's evidence in exchange for being allowed to plead to a third-degree murder. As part of that deal, she entered a guilty plea and accepted a term of 35 years with parole eligibility in 17. The other defendants, meanwhile, were facing much stiffer penalties. Each of them admitted their culpability at trial, even as they maintained that Justina Morley had been the mastermind behind it all. All three were convicted of murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and robbery. The sentence in each case was life without parole. Jason Sweeney's promising life had been needlessly snuffed out for the paltry sum of $500, money that he hoped would help pay for his way through military school. In the aftermath of the trial, his parents set up the Jason Keel Sweeney Foundation, which aims to fund scholarships to the Valley Forge Military School, the same academy their son had hoped to attend. 
All right, guys, I did four stories instead of three that time, um, but I'm going to end it here because it's almost at my 30-minute mark, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.